Um, I'm in LA and I'm Holly Root. I work at the Waxman Level Literary Agency and um, I'm excited to be doing some Q&A with these lovely ladies. And I'm Martha Mihalik and I'm coming to you from Brooklyn. I'm an editor at Green Willow Books, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. And I'm Molly O'Neill. I am also coming to you from Brooklyn and I'm an editor at the Catherine Teigen Books imprint of HarperCollins. So we um, asked you guys to give us some awesome questions on the Twitter, um, which we all love and use, and we got really good ones. So we're just going to dive in and start answering you guys' questions. Um, the first one that we got that was actually like three or four different people asked this question um, was the difference between middle grade and YA. And a couple people asked this a couple different ways. Like, does, the first one was, does having one 17 and one 25-year-old point of view character make it no longer a young adult? Somebody else said, what's the line between YA and middle grade? Isn't there a fine line between kid lit, middle grade, and YA? Um, if it comes in at a certain word count, the language is older, but the theme is younger, what is that? So it sounds like you guys are definitely curious about what constitutes um, a middle grade novel, a YA novel, an adult novel. So if one of you ladies wants to tackle that fun question, go right ahead. I know, many um, Martha. <laughs> thanks. Uh, I would say that, yes, like age of the characters, word count, all come into play with, um, with whether it's middle grade or YA, but I think the largest piece is the perspective of the characters. Um, one of the things that I think makes a middle grade book a middle grade book is that it's usually about um, the kid being a part of a group, like whether it's that they belong to the family or that they belong with their friends at school, it's about them and their place within something. Whereas I think YA is often, even if they, it is about belonging, YA is often about going off and finding your own path and uh, looking forward and like coming into your own life rather than where you fit in somewhere else. I would totally agree with that. Um, Molly? Yeah, I agree too. Um, really everything Martha said, um, middle grade sort of has a lot more to do with discovery of sort of the world around you and, and everything that's maybe opening up for the first time. You're realizing that um, your family is different than other families, that your friends are different than, than other people at your school or in your activities. Um, YA tends to be a little bit more about so you know the world's out there and you're trying to figure out where is your place in all of it. Yeah, and I mean, from I think I'm, I'm the only one who works an adult. Um, and it, the difference, I think, there is as much intended audience as anything else. And it's interesting because there's so much YA crossover now, and even, honestly, adults reading middle grade. Um, but if the book is intended and truly at spirit for a teen, um, I think that shows in the perspective. So like there are lots of adult novels with young protagonists, but they're all pretty much intended, their primary readership is adults. So you have to think about that as well as age. And I think you can tell um, the difference between adult and YA often because an adult novel about a young person will have a lot of nostalgia about mm -hmm. being a teenager or a child and a teen or middle grade book will not have that nostalgia yet because you're still living it, like you haven't gone far enough to be looking back. And I think what you have in the place of that nostalgia is often a real immediacy and um, this, this feeling that, you know, whatever the, the issue that you're facing today is like the best day of your life, the worst day of your life, that, that feeling that you get when you're a teenager and, and everything really is epic and high and low and... Um, and everything before you. What? Like everything's before you. The, the possibilities are endless, whereas adult books, they're like, yeah, that was back there was the best day of my life, and now it's over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that we work in kids' books. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So I guess the next questions we had, I'm just going to read some. Oh, can because I add one more thing? Because uh -huh. there, was, there was a specific question that was like, does having one 17-year-old and one 25-year-old make it no longer YA? And I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that's a really easy way to say that something's not young adult or adult, but um, there's a book that we're publishing called The Peculiar, which is middle grade, and it has a kid um, protagonist 
and an adult protagonist, and it totally works, and it does break that rule. So I think that if you can really nail it, then that doesn't matter. And that's sort of not one of the questions, but just a good point in general, is that like none of the things we're going to say tonight are hard and fast rules, and none of the things you're going to hear at Right On Con over these next two days are hard and fast rules. Like You'll probably hear conflicting advice um, from different people, even about certain things. It's, it's all about you know doing what you're trying to do well, um, and you know you you can not everyone can break the rule, but if you can do it really really well, sometimes that's something that that stands out a lot. I mean, uh, a book that comes to mind that a lot of people have read in the last couple of years, The Book Thief, um, was narrated by the character of Death. Not a lot of people could have pulled that off, but that author did, and it was fantastic. Yeah, or I mean, Codename Verity is another one that, like, maybe the ages are not necessarily the most clear-cut, like, eh, what age are they really, um, but is executed so brilliantly that it's hard to dispute. So you have to just be so good that you're indisputable. I like that it looks like we're the, the angel and the devil on the shoulders of this pirate. What are you going to do? <laughs> Go with me. Okay, next Why question. Why do you pick the one with most treasure? <laughs> hey, gold. Gold. All right, um, so our next question was um, sort of another double dipper where a couple people had the same question. Um, all about sort of platform and its importance. Um, at Mojo Fingers asked, can you explain what an author's platform means to you and what effect it might have on how slash if you take on a manuscript? And then at Krista Van Dolzer said, hi Krista. Um, what can a writer do to build her online presence, and do you ever take that into account when considering a manuscript? Um, I mean, I will speak to this from the agent perspective just really quickly, and that's that platform in fiction in general and in kids' fiction in specific is icing on the cake, not the cake. Um, it is great if you have notoriety. It's, I mean, look, Chris Colfer's book, top of the bestseller list. People know who he is. They knew he had a book out. Like, that's hard to argue with. Um, but for me, it's still so much more about storytelling um, than it is about just you saying, I have, you know, 50,000 Twitter followers or whatever. Um, the other thing about platform that I would caution you on is it's a very easy thing to chase that, you, that doesn't actually involve you actually doing the work of writing a great book. Um, so it, it can make you feel like you're being very productive while being a way to not put the time in on your book. So for me, it's like, it's fantastic if it's there, but book first, um, Twitter following, or whatever the new thing is second. Yeah, um, platform can give you sort of a, a running start sometimes, um, but it's not the substitute for writing a fantastic book that's unlike any other book I've read this year. Yeah, I'm not going to take something into acquisitions because I like someone's blog. I'm going to take something into acquisitions because I like the book that they wrote. Um, and I think that possibly the most important thing to think about when you're building, a, when you are building a platform is you want it to be a positive platform. Um, you know, I don't think that anyone's blog or Twitter feed or what have you would ever make me not sign or sign something up, but I think it would make me hesitate if... I checked someone out and they were always really negative or, you know, like just very undiplomatic. Um, I think that can hurt you rather than help you. Cool. All right. Um, so then we had this one super fun, which is why I put it right here at the beginning. Um, a bunch of people, myself included, asked us to <laughs> recommend um, kids' books. We had one specific request for a new middle grade that has you excited. And then... Um, I had said, and then Dust, at Dust Hansen, um, had said, uh, you get to steal one 2012 book and make it yours. What book is that and why? Um, so I will let you guys, let's do like one middle grade that we loved and then one book of any sort from 2012 that you would steal and make yours. Molly, you can start. Um, I actually, I read these questions in advance, so I brought a middle grade that I'm really excited about. Um, this is Destiny Rewritten. Um, and it comes out in March of uh, next year. It's the third book by Catherine Fitzmorris, um, who is a great middle grade writer. She's got 
uh, her books always have like really strong setting and um, really, really charming characters. And this is about a little girl who um, is born with a certain destiny. Um, her, her mother believes that she is fated to become a poet like her namesake, uh, Emily Dickinson, but Emily Davis has uh, some different feelings about that. And so she is trying to find her way um, while also trying to find a, sort of a, a very important object that's gone missing. And there's a lot of sort of charm woven in from there. So Destiny Be Written, look for it in March by Catherine Fitzmaurice. Um, and then a 2012 book that I've loved. Um, one of you guys is probably going to say Codename Verity, so I'll let you have that. Um, but I loved that book. Um, but yeah. What? We can all say it. Well, co so Codename Verity is a YA that, that I think a lot of people in publishing are really admiring right now because um, I think it does what it set out to do really, really masterfully. Excuse me, really masterfully. It um, it just was so carefully put together, um, and so that that I think is a really exciting read. And then there's a, a middle grade that one of my colleagues just published called The One and Only Ivan, which is the kind of middle grade that only comes along once in a very rare while. Um, it, it has some of the same feeling that Charlotte's Web does. It kind of breaks your heart and then puts it back together and makes you a little bit more human along the way. So The One and Only Ivan by Catherine Applegate is a wonderful middle grade book. Um, for middle grade book, I would, uh, I have to say The Peculiar by Stefan Bachman, which is one of ours. It is one of the most incredible books I've read in a few years, I think. Um, and it's set in Victorian London-ish in, in an alternate sort of reality where the door to fairy opened and there was this very cataclysmic event and a war between the fairy and the humans. Um, and it's so imaginative and creepy and compelling and just about belonging and finding your place, which we were talking about before. And it's so good. So I highly recommend that. And I, for a non-Green Willow book, I loved Liar and Spy, which will be out, I think, shortly um, by Rebecca. Yeah, it came out this week. It did? Mm -hmm. I thought it came out, like, next week. Uh, I just bought it on Amazon. Oh, really? I thought it was, like, the 21st. Well, it's out now, so buy it now. Um, and for 2012 book that I would want to steal if I could, I, it's totally codenamed Verity. Um, I mean, I've read a lot of good books this year, but that one really stands out. It's so smart, and the author is so good at, um, at, at making us reach higher when we're reading, at, at making us be the best reader we can be and, and rewarding that effort. And I and I love love stories about best friends. So it just totally it got me on every level. You know what? I'm gonna jump back in for a second and say about Codename Verity. There was a question later, um, Eliana uh El Belful at Twitter asked if you have a YA, she asked specifically about fantasy, but if you have a YA with no romance, is it harder to sell? Um, and that is sort of a, a rare YA without romance, um, which is something that isn't as common, but I think it totally worked because um, it was about what, what was the most important relationship in this teenage girl's life, um, which was her, her relationship with her best friend. So sort of answering a question from later in our set of questions. Check. Yay! Um, I will pimp a book that is coming out actually next year, so sorry, um, but that I just sold this spring on the middle grade question um, by an author of mine named Nancy J. Cavanaugh. Um, the title might change, but it will for sure involve some variation on the word ratchet. Um, it's this very, very sweet story talking about like belonging and finding your place in the world and recognizing that there's a world that's different than like your home and family. Um, and what really worked for me about that book and what makes it so special and exciting, um, aside from a very indelible main character, is that Nancy tells it entirely in like journal assignment, like it's the character's homeschooled. And it's like her language arts notebook that tells the story of a particular moment in time for her. So it's a fun, like, she plays with form in such a really great way while not ever letting it prevent 
the heart and emotion from coming through. Um, so it's just a really special book that I'm very excited about. Uh, and Sourcebooks will publish that in spring of next year. Um, and then for a book that I would steal, I mean, Code and Gritty, we all love it. It's fantastic, and I would totally take it if you guys hadn't. Um, so to change it up, I will go with, um, I think it came out in 2012, Born Wicked. Did that come out this year? Oh, yeah, that's a great book. I freaking loved that book, man. Like, I loved that book. Um, the sister story in it. I mean, yes, I had it on my shelves. Hey, there you go. By Jessica Spotswood. Yes, shout and out. It to came her. out in February. Yes. Um. So, like, really great romance. Really like fun and like compelling and like very much caught up in that moment. Um. One of the best love triangles I've read. Um. And just like. The, the sister story, man. The sister story slayed me. It's the same thing you were saying, Martha, about friend stories. Sister stories are kind of that way for me, too. I just love them. Cool. So we next? Yeah. yeah. All right, so our next question um, is, what makes a good first line totally hook you? And I, if I may sc scamper away and get a visual aid, will do a little reading because um, I actually have one in mind. So you guys, like, break it down or something while I <laughs> um, All right. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to dance, but I'll start. Um, I think a great <laughs> a great first line for me tells me something I don't expect. I think the the sort of common the thing I see most often in manuscripts that really does nothing for me that I think a lot of writers take what's well-meaning advice and, and do the wrong thing with it, people get told start with a lot of action. And so you see a lot of things where it's like so-and-so walked in the door, threw down their backpack, um, you know, grabbed a snack from the fridge, ran upstairs and slammed the door yelling, I hate you you know, or something like that. And it's, it's a lot of action, but it doesn't matter that much because we don't really know the character or why sh we should care about their feelings yet. And on the flip side, so if that doesn't work, what does? I think um, for me, it's, it's something that tells me something I don't expect about a character or maybe sets me up to think that I know, you know, what's going to happen at the end of the sentence and it takes me somewhere totally different. And because it's sort of caught me off guard or done a little bit of a switcheroo on me, um, it, it just, I'm, I'm in and I want to know what happens next. Um, actually, Codename Verity, man, none of us published that book, uh, none of us agented that book, but we love it and we're, we're doing a good job shilling for it um, <laughs> wherever you are, Kat Onder and Ginger Clark who edited and agented it, you're welcome. Um, but the, the first line of that book is, I am a coward and like, bam, you're in, because that's not something people usually admit the moment you meet them, and yet this character does. Yeah, I would say a good first line gives you a sense of, of specificity somehow, or a sense of, the, like, it's not generic, it couldn't just come from anyone or any situation, like, it's very specific to your story and your character. Um, and I can give an example, but I'm going to let Holly do her magic first. Uh, I'm going to piggyback off of that, which was like a perfect, like you basically just <laughs> that up for me. I'm going to swack it. Um, so this is the lovely Hex Hall by Rachel Hawkins, who is a client of mine. Um, and actually a funny instance of like probably the only book I can think of where after it sold, we added a prologue. So huh, fun publishing fact. Um, her chapter one, and I'm just going to blatantly ignore the first line um, and instead give you like the first little exchange, which I think is functionally the same thing, um, which is as follows. Well, I stepped out of the car and into the hot, thick heat of August in Georgia. Awesome, I murmured, sliding my sunglasses on top of my head. Thanks to the humidity, my hair felt like it had tripled in size. I could feel it trying to devour my sunglasses like some sort of carnivorous jungle plant. I always wondered what it would be like to live inside somebody's mouth. Like, I, I read that and was like, I'm in. Like, it's funny, it's specific, I'm Southern, I know exactly what that feels like, um, and it's, it was just such a, like, funny idea of what is to come, um, and I just, it's, it's exactly what you're going to get the rest of the book. 
And you know what else is great about it? Like that that analogy of like what it feels like to be at, in someone's mouth, that's not a cliche. Like you've never heard yeah. that before. So it catches you off guard and does that unexpected thing. Yeah. The funny thing is now, um, I've actually seen it pop up in a couple of like subsequent submissions or books or whatever. And I'm sort <laughs> of like, huh. <laughs> um, my example of one that a good first line that <laughs> totally sucked me in from the very, very, very beginning. And Holly, I think, will be able to attest to this too, is Ray Carson's Girl of Fire and Thorns, um, which Holly agented and I edited. And we talk about every time we do this yeah, thing, like literally. We can't okay. not talk about Ray. Um, the first line of that book, which I don't have at home, uh, but I can just tell you what it is because I have it memorized, um, is today is the day of my, today is my 16th birthday. It is also my wedding day. And I think that's a good first line, and it takes you somewhere because, like, in a fantasy, you kind of expect the wedding to be at the end, and she's like, bam, right in the beginning, you know that this character is getting married. Um, but the line that made me know within minutes of opening the manuscript that I wanted to publish it was about four lines later. And it's, I am praying no begging that my future husband, King Alejandro de Vega, will be ugly and old and fat. Like, I read that line and I was like, oh, well, this isn't going somewhere where I expected it to go. And, you know, what it, I think it tells you a lot about the character and her state of mind. I think it sets up an interesting conflict, even if you don't really know what that conflict is yet. Like, I, it did something so unexpected and I was just like, yes, yes, a thousand times yes. <laughs> and that's what you want us to say like that's I feel like there's um, sometimes when I'm at conferences and stuff I feel like people are looking for permission or like to try to get away with something a little bit like can I pull it off and I think that what you're seeing in how we're talking about these books is that you don't want permission and you don't want it's okay you want someone to be like and I'm in so it's you know just something to keep in mind um all right, I had a really super quick one here that was about agent email addresses, so I'll just knock it out because it's easy. The question was from at April Brown Wright, agent site doesn't list email address, agent query does, email or not, verify on Twitter or not. It never hurts to ask on Twitter. Um, some, depending on how big the agency is, like some people may not have um, a, like control over what the website design is or that level of granularity. So. I would say to go with the agent query because that is run by the agent. Moving on. Um, okay, I'm going to kick this to you guys because I don't really do um, picture books, but if an author and illustrator are working on a project together, is it okay for illustrator to submit the project on the author's behalf? And that's from at MLC Illustration. Um, I, I think that you obviously both need to be in agreement to who you're submitting to, but I don't think it matters which one of you does the actual submitting. Um, I think that normally it's the author, but that's, that's not a rule or anything. That's just sort of how it usually happens. Um, most of the and agents, so they're submitting on behalf of both of you. Yeah, and it, it certainly wouldn't be odd to, you know, obviously one person has to send it or mail it or whatever, but um, to have both your names on there and you, you make it clear in the cover letter that you're, you're working together and so-and-so is the primary contact um, and you go from there. Um, and another picture book question for you lovely ladies um, for, from at Danny Oldroyd. For children's picture books, is there a page amount to go by or if it is good enough, can it all be worked out? So, do you want to take it? Sure. Um, I put on I put on a cat mask. Um, it's my tribute to picture books and animals. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so the thing about picture books is that it has a lot to do with the way picture books are printed, which at least in this um, moment where the physical book is still the key way that, that most readers are reading picture books. Some read them on iPads or whatever, but that's not the primary way. Um, it, it has to um, most of the time fall into a, uh, the count of eight. Um, because of how 
the pages are printed. They're, they're sheets that are literally folded and gathered. And so the way they're folded, um, you can't have an odd number. Um, so the most common number is uh, 32 pages is your standard. Um, and from there, you would go up or down by eight. So 24 pages or 40 pages. Um, but deviating from the standard is usually a little bit more expensive in, in terms of production costs. So it's something that you know, you'd know you have to talk through with the, the editor and the art director that you're working with and, and figure out if that's the, the best way to work or not. Uh, I'll let Martha add anything. Um, I was just going to say, if you're just an author, you don't necessarily have to worry about breaking it up. I think it's really, really useful to make a blank dummy yourself and just lay out the text to see how the page turns work because that, the page turn is a huge, huge part of building pace and tension in a picture book. Um, so it's really useful for you to do that for your own benefit. You don't necessarily have to do it in the manuscript for me because that can, like, that's part of my job. That's part of the illustrator's job, too. So um, like, keep it in mind, but you don't have to say specifically what's going on what page. Cool. All right, so the, uh, and you guys feel free to like read questions if you want. I'm just going to be super bossy because I'm an oldest child. Um, That's fine. <laughs> so there was a question here um, from at Swirl and Swing who said, how specific should we be regarding genre in a query letter? For example, if a world is fantasy and technically dystopian, but the dystopian setting isn't really important, is it worth mentioning? Um, and since I'm the primary one seeing query letters, I'm going to full on through. Um, but for me, I always tell people to, like, when in doubt, use the biggest bucket. Um, don't worry about, like, I see a lot of submissions that are like, it's a steampunk alt history with a western flair, and, and like, all of a sudden, you just, like, you're just giving me reasons to say no, because what if I think I don't like that, but I actually do like yours? Um, so I sort of just tell people to give me, like, the biggest bucket. So, like, I have a book coming out um, in three weeks by an author named C.J. Redwine that is, in my eyes and the eyes of her lovely editor, um, a fantasy. But because of some things about the world, like, some people have been reacting to, like, oh, yay, and there's a dystopian element. And that's not really what we um, are leading with because it's not really the primary thing. So it's sort of, like, a lovely thing for the people who like that. Um, that they'll be able to come in and enjoy that. So that's sort of my, like, think about your biggest bucket and pitch with that, and then let the other things that are in there come out in the telling of the story. I agree. And I think that, um, I think it's useful for the author to know what genre they're writing and for us to see that they know that. Um, and sometimes that sort of thing, like, depending on what doing really well at the time it'll be coming out, like, you'll decide to put a different spin on it because of, like, a more minor setting thing or whatever. Um, but you need to know, like, who's your core audience and your core reader? And, and like, that's probably what you want to use in your query letter. And the other thing would be just um, be, be honest about it. Like, don't try to capitalize on a trend. You know, if, if you think that the hot thing right now is sci-fi, and there's literally two pages of your story that happen um, on Mars, but all the rest of it is straight up a contemporary story. Don't don't exaggerate and, and try to just fit it in um, because you think that's what people want. Be honest about what your story is. And be proud of it. Leave the weird market manipulations to the professionals. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do best. Um, and conveniently piggybacking off of that, um, we're doing great segueing, guys. Uh, the next question from at SC author is, this might be stupidly obvious, my favorite questions, um, but should we rush a book if the market is good for the book at that time? Um, the editors are probably going to say, no, you should never rush a book. Um, and I'm going to say, no, you should never rush a book with a few caveats. Um, if you are at the back end of a trend, it is going to be very hard for you. And if you are the kind of person who will revise something to death without making any substantial changes, and you know that you're going to spend six months fidgeting over, like, V or A in line 17 of page 58, like, I've got some people who don't like to let go. Um, if you are that person, 
you need to hit send if you see that there is a trend happening and you are afraid you will miss it. Um, if you are not that person and you are hoping to catch a trend and hoping that your book is good enough, um, you will, it, I don't think I've ever sold anything thinking, oh, maybe it's good enough. You know, good enough doesn't really cut it anymore, unfortunately, or fortunately. And I would say that if you're aware that there's a trend, we're probably already past it as far as like what we're looking for in submission because we work so far ahead that, you know, once the book's in the marketplace, we're probably already on to the next thing. So, like, I agree with Holly totally that, like, if rushing to you means not doing the fidgety revising that you might feel in your soul you want to, just hit send and do it because you should just get your work out there anyway. Cool. All right, so we had a question. Um, how should I format text messages in a manuscript? Should there be an extra space between them to show who's speaking? Anybody? That's a quick one. Um, you should format them so that it is clear to the reader what is happening. I don't have anything more specific to say than that. Like, there is no certain way to format a text message. I've seen it done various ways in things. And the most important part is that the reader knows what you're doing. So make that well, clear. And, and the, other, the other way to do it, I mean, you can try and, and decide what that would be, or you can just very simply in brackets, you know, put um, sort of like a stage direction in this sort of rare instance. You wouldn't do this a lot in a, in a manuscript, but you can say, you know, set as text message or design as text message. Um, and, and then we would know that when we're working on the book design, we'd have to be thinking about that. Cool. All right, next question. Um, Mark W. Carson wants to know, if you have a clear idea about a cover, which I know authors only give suggestions on, good job, Mark, uh, does anybody listen? That is a very sweet question. I will say from my standpoint as an agent, um, that is the kind of question you should totally ask your agent, because I have some editors I work with who, like, the way that their house is set up, they want to see, like, what covers do you love? What covers are you excited about? Like, so they'll ask you to sort of give them some things that make you happy, and then they'll go away and bring you back something. Um, I, you, I mean, it, the fact that you are asking, does anybody listen, means that you know that like, you don't get to do it in Microsoft Paint and send it in. Um, but yeah, I think people listen. We want the, everybody wants the author to be happy. I think, yeah, we, we totally listen. And sometimes we can listen a lot. And sometimes we can only listen a little bit. Because at the end of the day, um, we're, we're trying to make make money selling your book for you and for our companies. And um, sometimes we have a clearer sense of what will allow that to happen. And so, you know, I, I would never want to make the choice to put a cover on a book that is going to make the author perhaps very happy, but make the intended audience have zero interest in picking it up. So there's a little bit of a fine line there in, in terms of um, yeah, we listen, but what can we do with that input? It's, it's a really individual scenario. But they definitely think that every author should feel free to speak up. Like, you shouldn't feel like you can't bring up an idea or a question or anything to your agent or to your editor. Like, we all want you to be the happiest you can be and to have a beautiful book that you're proud of. Okay. So we are we're running, of course, we spent like 40 years talking about all the books we love. Um, so now we have to like pick up the pace. So we're going to hustle through some questions here. Um, first one, are boy protagonists in YA a hard sale? What does it take for these books to catch your eye? I just published a boy protagonist in YA, so I would say no. And what caught my eye was his voice and the world he was in and the fact that it was really funny and really um, smart. And I want to be friends with this character. Yeah, I think. Oh, the, the book she's referring to is Insignia by S.J. Kincaid, and I enjoy the pants off of it, and I'm a girl. So mm -hmm. I think that's the thing, is it has to be something that, like, I, I think that trying to sort of reduce boy books down to, like, boy books is as dangerous as reducing girl books down to girl books. So ideally, we're doing something that everybody can be excited about. Yeah, I want, I think that what we're all looking for, I mean, I think that there are books that are just for boys, and I think there are books that are just going to sell to girls, but I think that what we all really, really want is something that's universal, and you either want to, like, 
be friends with that person or be that person, and it doesn't in the end matter if it's a boy or a girl. So, you know, you just, you want to write a really good character. And if you're the kind of person who's taking notes about things you want to look up later, go to the blog of Shannon Hale, um, the author of Princess Academy and a lot of other great books, who just did really recently, in the last couple of weeks, a really thoughtful, kind of heartbreaking blog post about um, having a boy reader who absolutely loved her books, and then in, in front of her, his, his mother sort of shamed him for it. And it was a really, a really thoughtful, provocative post um, about, you know, letting readers decide what books are for them and not um, the adults in their life being always the one to boil it down. So Shannon Hale, H-A-L-E, her blog. All right, uh, so Pam Harris writes, wants to know if people still want straight historical YA or if it usually needs to have a fantasy mystery twist. Um, I will say that I saw a lot of sort of like Regency spy girl novels sell um, like last year in the spring, I guess, um, like a year ago. So they'll be coming out soon, so that's good. Um, I've seen, I feel like I've seen more sort of general historical. I, I think that the idea of fantasy mystery I think we're seeing more genre blending in general, so I don't know that that's unique to historical. What do you guys think? I think that historical, um, a lot of times the ones that don't work that I see, I can tell that the writer is only writing it because they're interested in the time period, not necessarily the character or the story they're telling, and I think that's the kind of historical that's really boring. Um, I think that... And I think that if you're writing any story, it's usually more than its time period. So, like, sometimes it is a fantasy. Sometimes it is a thriller. Sometimes it's, you know, a self-discovery book. Um, so, like, yeah, I do, I do think it's important to have something else to it, but I think it's because your book can't only be about a time period. I think for me the really important thing is resonance. I want this book about a character who lived a long time ago to say something really meaningful and to make me as, as a reader living today make some connections between that character's life and, and my life and that sort of resonance and connection is, is really, really important. It has to be more than just what happened to someone one day a long time ago. Cool. All right, J. Earl Madison wants to know if uh, publishers will accept a self-published trade paperback instead of a manuscript for evaluation. Um, at my side of things, I, I mean, people can send whatever, but why would you when that paperback is going to cost you money and emailing me doesn't? That's, I mean, it's just a cost thing for me. Yeah, I, I have no problem getting a self-published paperback to read, but um, I read manuscripts on my e-reader almost exclusively now, so having a digital file just means that I'll definitely have it with me at all times. <laughs> I think the important thing is it's not going to impress me that you did that. I'm still going to regard it just as a manuscript. If that's what you have and, and you want to send it, um, sure, but it's not going to make me think any differently about it than if it was just a Word document set in Times New Roman. Cool. All right. If an author's been published before, do they get priority over could-be debut authors? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Yeah. If they've published with me before, yes, for sure. <laughs> um, if they've published before and I'm huge fans of their work, yeah, that usually goes to the top of my pile. But at the same time, if an agent I love and respect, such as one Miss Holly Root, calls me and is like, I have this fantastic debut, that goes to the top of my pile too. So I think it, you, can't, um, you can't just like make that call without the specifics of the, the situation. Totally. All right, and then I had two that were sort of similar. Um, one what, from Dawn Starpony. Um, how long does it take once the agent has accepted a manuscript to actually get published in print? And then another one from SC author. How long on average does it take for a book to be published from query to bookstore? Um, so we're, we're now in the, in the section of questions where the answer is going to be repeatedly, it depends. Yep. It's, it does. I think, like, the, the, I'm trying to think about the fastest. Um, if a book is, like, a crash, I think you could probably say a year, but that's crazy and does not happen very often. Um, and this is in kids. Like, in adults, sometimes stuff happens faster. Um, 
the longest. I mean, I think I've had people that I like worked with for three years before we sold something, and then it'll be another like two years before the book comes out. Like it just, yeah, it all happens on its own time. And that's not happening because the publisher just like sits on it. It's because certain parts of the process are going to take longer. Maybe the author has to do a huge revision, or maybe in copy editing um, they discovered a huge hole that really took a lot of thinking to figure out, or you know things like that. Maybe um, maybe the the first round of illustrations didn't work, and and you really had to go back to the drawing board or pick a different illustrator entirely. Um, that's going to set. Um, set things back as well. So it depends. Yeah, and also, um, I mean, some, sometimes it's all about like what needs to work on the manuscript, but on our side, often it's what's on our list and how many books we have per season. Is there anything else on that list that would compete with this one and we'd rather not do that and have it be like the one book that's a fantasy on that list or something like that? Um, so there's a lot of strategy involved in publishing a book, and, and that can affect how long it takes. Because as publishers, we don't want just to publish you. We want to publish you well. And so that's where the strategy comes in. All right, we gotta, we got to make time here. So we're right. going to through some. Um, someone wanted to know if we were actually reading all these questions. Yes. 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 Um, let's see. How often do editors give personalized rejection letters with edits for the manuscript or the like? Somebody else also asked something about like um, if like what what the agents get from the editors and things like that. So I will let you guys speak to that. Um, I have recently realized that I can't be as personal in most of my rejections as I in my heart would like to be because um, then I just would be even further behind than I am. Uh, so I usually only respond with personal stuff if I. Uh, really think that I would want to read the book again with revision or if I really think that the author is so promising that I would want them to keep working and see what they have coming next. Yeah, like if yeah, I sort of have the vision to see and, and know exactly what needs to happen to drastically fix whatever the plot problems are and, and really then suddenly if they that it will work, um, then then I might write something lengthier, but um, the, the truth of it is, I know writers really want that sort of feedback. It's a lot harder to articulate what's not working about a manuscript um, than it may be than it maybe seems. Because when when it's working well, that's that's the easy part. It, it's all working if it's working. Um, isolating what's not working when it's not working is. Um, sort of like sticking me in front of an engine of a broken down car and going, what's, what's not working? I'm like, I, I don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> I would also say, I mean, just from my side of like why I don't give more necessarily detailed feedback all the time, um, if I knew how to fix it, a lot of times I would. Like a lot, like if I love something, I'm, like there's probably still something I'm going to ask somebody to tweak, and I think that's the case. Like it's not like you guys only buy manuscripts that are done that you're like not going to do a thing to, but if you knew how to like get it there, it would be sort of sy symptomatic of a larger connection with the project. At least that's the case for me. Um, okay, if your first manuscript that you already found an agent for is a different genre than your second, do you have to find a different agent for the second manuscript? Um, usually no, unless they're like wildly divergent and your agent doesn't rep the second one, but again, that's something you'd work out with your own personal agent. Um, a question here for you editor ladies, what's the state of printed YA children's book sales to libraries? Is it a major concern for publishers? I can um, take this one. Yeah, uh, take it. All right, so my, th and this is going to be a little bit of a longer answer, but I'll answer other ones fast, Holly. Um, <laughs> So, because this is going to require, the, the answer to this question requires a little bit of a history lesson about children's publishing. Do you want to cut in and cut off my I'm history lesson? I'm just going to say, answer it instead of explain why your answer is long. I'm editing you. Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once upon a time, like maybe when we were um, all young reader age, uh, the this isn't a political statement, but the government, um, 
allowed for a lot of funding for schools and libraries, which meant that the biggest customers of publishers were schools and libraries. Um, and so that was who we focused on publishing for. As a lot of that funding has gone away over the last few decades, um, different, different larger buyers of books have stepped in. Now it's um, large chain bookstores, and so we focus on them a little bit more than we once did. Um, so yes, the library market is shrinking. Uh, at the same time, it's still a really powerful market um, and a really important, important piece of the business because when librarians get behind a book, miraculous things can happen for the life of that book and for the career of that author. Um, but at the same time, you know, when something goes away a little bit. Uh, what has changed for um, them. And, okay, technical difficulties, but we're all good. Um, and. I was saying that when things go away, they come back, which is what just happened for us. Um, and really what will always come back to you, Internet. Come in and take its place. Um, suddenly there's a lot more adult readers reading YA books, for example, than there ever were back in the time when libraries were the strongest purchaser of books. So um, we're continuing to see a, a market for the books. They're just different than maybe they were at a different point in time. That was really long-winded. I'm sorry. Yeah, but now we're in a new hangout. So it's but now we're in a new hangout. You got part two of the video right on con. I bet you didn't know this was happening. We didn't either. We should yeah. have known because we're wordy that way. We, we're we in publishing. We like series. What are you going to do? Um, yeah. Okay. So we have a fantastic compliment, which I'm going to bask in for a second, from yeah. at just Julie Helms, who says, you three are at the top of my favorite list in publishing. Aww. Yeah. Um, no joke. So I was wondering, why did you choose the job you have? Um, I will I tell you, I'm an agent because I would be an aggressively terrible editor. Um, and <laughs> I, <laughs> it's true, I, I was an editor um, initially. and. There were things I was great at and things I was terrible at, and being an agent fit me so much better, and I love it, and now I'm totally unemployable as anything else, so publishing, you're stuck with me. We're okay with that. Um, I became an editor, I think, mostly because I adore reading more than anything else, and I adore stories more than anything else, and... I, I can't think of anything more powerful or meaningful that I could do besides give kids the experience like I had when I was discovering whole new worlds and whole new friends in characters and, and learning about life um, when I was a kid. Like, I just, I wanted, I wanted to, to give that to people, and I'm, I'm not a writer. Um, I, I don't really care to be a writer. Um, but I really love getting in stories and helping to fix them and then being able to get them into, into hands of readers. That's a really hard one to follow because Martha actually said a lot of the things um, that I feel as well, which is why Martha and I have determined that had we known each other at like the age of eight, we would have so been besties. <laughs> Our hanging out would have totally involved like sitting there and reading all day. Yeah. We've been really exciting that way. Um, but I think I'm an editor. Um, it's it's my dream job. Um, I came into the business, I started on the marketing side, and I enjoyed it, but um, I enjoy being an editor about 800 times more, and I love, um, I love the environment. I love that part of my job is to think about big questions and to help kids think about those questions, too. I love that my job is being surrounded by some of the most wickedly talented and amazingly creative and passionate people um, I can I can think up and I like that I get to live inside stories um, you know every now and then it sort of strikes me you know what did I do today at work you know and um, gosh I think the stories that I get to live in and um, 
be a part of, it's a lot more interesting than banking or something like that. No offense to bankers. But um, also it doesn't involve all that much math, and that's my final answer. <laughs> it involves distressing, distressing amounts of math, though. It's true. <laughs> yeah, and if you hate math, you should not be an agent. So just putting, putting that out there. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, just Julie Helms also wanted to know, Molly, I think it was you who mentioned on Twitter a while ago about a romantic interest unlike any you've read before. What do you mean? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. I was talking about a specific character in a book that's coming out next summer um, by a debut author. Her name is Hilary Smith, and the title of the book, um, which we just came up with, is called Wild Awake. Um, oh, that's good. Isn't that good? Yeah. Um, and the love interest in that book is really, really hard to describe. He's not your average love interest. He's not dreamy and swoony and, you know, he doesn't have smoldering eyes and, and all of these things that are a little bit um, stereotypical about love interests in YA. But at the same time, he's magnetic and just really, really appealing. And so... I, I can't describe him because I can't even articulate what's so fantastic about him. Um, his name is Skunk. We'll start with that. Um, who, who would think you'd fall in love with a boy named Skunk? Anyways, Wild Awake. Look for it next summer. Hillary Smith. I mean, I think I speak for us all in saying that, like, as lovely as the, like, and he's so hot, and he's so super hot, and, like, that's all I could think about was how he was super hot. Like, that works for a reason, but there's been so much of it that I'm much more interested in seeing a why. Like, I think Stephanie Perkins, who's fantastic and writes great teen romance, um, like, I think she does such a great job of making her heroes, like, the, the love interests, um, really indelible and different and kooky, so. Yeah, I, honestly, if I get the he's so hot within the first five pages of a manuscript that's a romance, like, it totally turns me off, because I don't believe it. Like, yeah. I don't believe in um, Love at First Sight and manuscripts, actually. And also, just as a reader and as a person, I, I fall for the nerd boys. So, like, he's so hot is great and all, but, like, give me a nerd boy. <laughs> all right. Um, so we are really, we're try, we're going to try really hard to be fast. Um, is it okay for the plot pacing of a literary fiction to be slow? I would say it's okay if it is slow. It's not okay if it feels slow. Ladies? Mm. I would say you don't ever really want the pace of any book to be slow because that means the reader has good places to put it down. Um, I think that it's okay for a literary fiction not to be action-packed. I don't think that's the same thing as having a slow pace. And I think even if a book is not action-packed, it's going to be, it should be emotion-packed. You know, if you're saying there's not a lot of something, then you need to be giving, like, double helpings of something else. All right. Um, if you have a YA with an extracurricular focus like the arts, will it be difficult to market to a broader audience? I mean, I sort of feel like, look, we're selling books here. We're not in the video game business. Like, we're already talking to, like, your... I think that doesn't every book have some sort of extracurricular focus, and that's part of what we use to market it? I think the author of that question was maybe asking something very specific about their manuscript, and I'm sorry that we're not able to ascertain okay. in 140 characters exactly what that is. But go arts! Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've done books with theater and music and, like, choral singing. Like, you know. I've yeah. actually been dying for a book that's, like, a backstage experience to do with any of the arts, so it would be... Uh. An A plus yeah. in my book. All right. Yeah. Um, Someday there will be a, a manuscript about dancers, and Martha and I will fight over it. Mm -hmm. We've already decided this. Uh, so let's see. Question here from C. R. Boone, and I actually think Tina that you answered your question yourself, but I'm going to read it anyway and see if they agree. Um, what are some things to consider when writing for reluctant or busy YA readers, in addition to universal themes and a compelling story? I mean. I, I sort of feel like universal team themes, a compelling story, and great writing, and congrats. Yeah. And a really identifiable character who's flawed, probably. And I think um, one of the things you can think about when you're writing a reluctant reader book is the structure. Um, often, 
books that have really, really good hooks in the beginning of chapters and cliffhangers at the end and have shorter chapters are good reluctant reader books. Cool. All right, um, question here from Barb Air. And saying Twitter handles is ridiculous. Um, very happy with my first publisher, except wish I had more publicity. Should I send my second sub to the same or switch publishers? Oh, Barb, I am here to tell you that I don't think there's an author alive who is happy and is like, everybody, I got more publicity than I wanted. Like, you will <laughs> never, like, publicity is like money. You will never have enough. Um, if you were happy in every other regard, publicity is not the hill to die on because it's ultimately not under the control of your publisher. It's up to, like, they can't make an outlet cover a book. All they can do is pitch you. It's sort of like with um, foreign rights for agents, like when people are like, my agent didn't sell my book, so I'm firing them. We can't make someone buy your book. We can pitch it and we can market it aggressively, but beyond that, like, there's a certain element of free will, which, darn that free will. Anybody? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I think we'll have something to say about this. Carolyn Pilgrim wanted to know, I've heard book tours and other in-person appearances don't sell many copies and are a waste of time. Do you agree? I, I don't think that anyone in publishing would agree that book tours are a waste of time. Um, I don't think that they're... I think it's hard to get teens, in particular, into bookstores. Um, so I think it's hard, and I don't think it necessarily means skyrocketing sales. I think it, regardless, can be really, really useful for an author to go into a bookstore and meet the teens who are there and meet the booksellers and have that personal connection, and I think that is really valuable. So my first boss in publishing, um, who had done her job in, in marketing for 30 years, used to always answer this question with the same answer. And she would say, you never know who you're going to meet. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, maybe you'll do a book signing and only five people will come. But because only five people come, you get to talk to all of them longer. And maybe it turns out that one of them just accidentally stumbled into the book signing, but she got really interested and she takes your book home and, hey, it turns out her husband or her cousin or her sister is um, the person who buys books for an entire school district. Or, you know, it, like the six degrees of separation thing can happen a lot. Um, great example, I, uh, one of my authors, we did a dinner at a conference in November and I invited a teacher that I got to know on Twitter. Um, just, you know, to give her a chance to meet this author. And nine months later, she emailed me and said, guess what? Um, I just bought a whole classroom set of that book, and it's going to be part of my curriculum next year. Um, so it wasn't like an instantaneous thing, um, but you never know where it's going to lead you. I think the one thing about this is, is there's a little bit of a difference of if your publisher is sending you on a book tour versus if you're funding the whole thing yourself, um, because that can be very expensive and, and at that point you do have to maybe ask yourself, you know, what am I looking to get out of this and what is going to make it in my mind a success if I'm spending X amount of money of my own, um, from my own bank account. Uh, so that's a little bit different than if your publisher is sending you on one. Agreed. All right. Uh, Sam Hager wants to know, if you meet an author in person, what do you want to hear about their project to interest you in 60 seconds or less? Um, as someone who gets pitched at conferences a lot, I mostly want you to be lovely and normal and a safe harbor for me in a very stressful weekend storm. Um, beyond that, if I say, so what do you write? I want concept, not plot. Like where people run off the rails is telling you plot, which you can't do in 60 seconds. Um, but concept should be like one line. Yeah, I think Go ahead. Another way that you can answer this, um, at least to give an editor or an agent an idea of what you write, and if we're really sticking to the 60-second rule, is to say, you know, I'm writing books that are in, you know, the same um, tone as whatever. You know, I'm writing fantasy similar to Graceling, or I'm writing, um, you know, contemporary romance like Stephanie Perkins or something like that, because it does two things. It, it tells me a little bit about your book, and it tells me that you know a little bit about the market, which is never a bad thing. Yeah, and I would say that I would, I've never had someone tell me about their book in 60 seconds or less at a writer's conference, and that would be amazing if, if you kept it that short. Um, and, you know, 
just to reiterate what Holly said, you don't want to tell me the plot. You want to tell me what the story is about. Like, at its heart, in its soul, what is your story about, not what happens in it. Cool. All right. Uh, question here from Jenny Martin, uh, who said, what author skill set, if any, is the most underrated? Ooh. Good question. I think I think we underrate the actual author part of being an author a lot and the people who can really handle the post publication stuff with grace are amazing and and I think that that's really valuable because you know you're probably writing your next book you're trying to do publicity and market and every and get your you know, current book out there, and to be able to juggle all of those hats, I think is invaluable. I think for me, it would be um, external sense of validation, um, because when I like when you drill down what like where the real unhappiness in publishing comes from, um, and where like it gets hard to do my job, and I think everybody's job. Um, is what, like when people are looking for publishing to fill a really big hole in their life, like when that's where they're taking their worth, um, it will like publishing will never do that for you. I don't care. Like if you have the hugest book that ever was, it will never be enough. Um, so if I could only pick like one thing, like emotionally, for my authors to have in their toolkit, it would be that publishing would be important to them and not define them as humans. I think for me it would be um, uh, an author who is actively on their own working to become a better writer with every book because um, you know publishing isn't a master's degree in writing. Um, I can't teach you everything in the world about writing. I can very specifically as an editor help make your book stronger um, and that's my job but I'm going to be able to do that um, better if you know you are um, sort of scaling new heights with every book and setting new challenges for yourself and um, you know deciding the, the things that are going to make you that much stronger as a writer and I think one of the highest compliments I can give an author is when I say you know like her second book was stronger than her first you know the you know I loved her early book but like wow this one blew me away when you can see an author growing like that you know that they sort of have the endurance to have a whole career and not just sort of a, a flash in the pan moment. Um, so question here, what causes the most shock in first time publishing authors about the publishing experience? Um, I think it's that nobody ever believes me. Everyone thinks they're going to be the exception that like, oh I got this, I can totally write three books in three years, that's no big deal at all. And then it's like, and freak out in five, four, three, there it is. Like it just, it's never, like life happens. And in, I think when you're working before you have a contract, you have this sense of how fast you can write. Um, and even people who are really fast writers often get rolled by the other stuff that goes along with being published. Um, so underestimating like what the gig is, I guess is probably mine. Yeah, I agree. I think um, first-time authors are probably most shocked at how much of being an author is not writing, mm -hmm. and and that you know, like you're you're probably writing in addition to your job until you get a contract. And most, if most people probably continue to work their day jobs um, afterwards, but even the ones who don't, like writing a job, and you have to like sit down at a desk for you know eight hours a day, even if it's you know, the eight hours at night when the rest of us are sleeping. Um, and, and I think that's a, I think adjusting to, to writing as a job is really hard. Mm -hmm. and, and balancing, kind of going with, with both of those things, you know, it's, it's easier with your first book than it will ever be again, because you only have the one book to think about. But once you're, um, you know, doing copy edits on the first book, doing maybe, you know, outlining or revising or writing on the second book and you're trying to juggle, juggle publicity and then just life, um, figuring out what to give your attention to can be, can be a challenge. Cool. 
All right, um, question here. What's the best way to get new kid lit from you, presumably the writer, uh, to the consumer, reviews, web, et cetera? Um, I think that kids, part of why that we're, we're still seeing like the, the E stuff, um, not that it doesn't affect kids, but it's like a slightly slower click over of like print books to ebooks. Um, is because there's still a lot of gatekeepers between kids and books, and rightfully so. Like, kids are not, like, plugged into their Kindle with, like, their credit card in there. Um, so I think reviews and web are great um, for getting that crossover audience, especially. But when it comes to kids, there still is not much substitution for teachers and librarians, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there's a magic one best way to get um, a book to a kid. I think it can often depend on what kind of book it is. Um, but I think that, you know, like being available as an author and like getting yourself out there and talking to teachers and librarians and talking to teens when appropriate, um, I think that can all definitely help. And I think you're never going to reach in one blow all of the kids everywhere. So you have to sort of start, like the question I always ask myself is, who's going to love this book first? You know, is it a book that from day one the librarians are going to embrace? Is it a book that from day one um, teachers are going to be able to bring it in and use it as a part of their curriculum? Is it going to be, you know, sort of a commercial success because it taps a pop culture nerve at the moment, things like that? Like, it's, it's always going to start somewhere and then hopefully ripple out from there and touch all of the other pieces too. Um, but it's it's a very rare book that, you know, everyone in the world buys all on the same day, which happens to be the first day it's available. Would that that happen tomorrow? Right. Um, if you right. have that book, Holly, send, send it to me. Yeah, I'll get right on that. Um, let's see. Eliana wanted to know, um, and these are, again, a couple that are kind of alike. Um, I'm not a great judge of my work unless the sentence wording sounds off. So how can I tell when I made, and I think this is a character that didn't come through, but when I've made good enough characters. Um, it, and then the second one was from Justin Swap. I know I need to make my manuscript the best I can, but when do I stop revising, editing, and look for an agent? The question of pressing send. <laughs> When do you press send? I think you press send when you hit the point that you don't know how to make the story any better or the character any better, um, not just the writing of it, because I think that a lot of writers can get very perfectionist. And Kelly, you talked about this before. And like you're just sort of fiddling with words. Mm -hmm. If you're at that stage, it's time to hit send and show it to somebody, because you've probably done all of the big work you can without another set of eyes looking at it. You should also be plugged into a writer's group of some sort, whether it's online or in person or SCBWI or WriteOnCon or like whatever it is. You need other humans reading your work who are not your family or your students. I get a lot of emails that are like, and my students love it. And I'm like, yeah, you also give your students grades. Like, I'm sure you're very nice and would never hold that against them, but not exactly impartial. I would say if you can read it aloud without flinching, you're probably ready to send it to somebody. That's probably All true. Answers. All right, um, let's see. And then a question here on what factors are required um, in YA contemporary romance where a lot of books seem alike. Um, I do a lot of romance, so I will say that if you are not naturally a romance reader, what you see as seeing alike is like the fact that you can only fall in love. So like, if, there's going to be touch points. They're not together at the beginning. They're together at the end. Like, those are immutable. Um, how you get there is the fun and should be where the originality comes in. And that's what makes romance such a huge selling genre is like, who are these people? How do they come together? Why? What holds them apart? Um, I think actually doing a really good romance is one of the hardest things you can do. I agree. And I think that um, one of the things that's required from romance that possibly doesn't get talked about enough is not just like the believability of the romance, but that whoever your main character is has to have their own story outside of the romance. Like if you think of Stephanie Perkins, Anna, like that's a romance and it's about Anna and um, St. Clair getting together. 
but it's also about her kind of finding her feet in a totally new place and figuring out how to belong there. So you need both pieces in order for the romance to work. Yeah, and I think um, good dialogue helps. You know, when you think yeah. about, like, the, the things that in a real-life romance, you know, make you sort of sweat a little and get fluttery and all those, you know, like, witty banter and unexpected little surprises and, and things like that, putting all of that into a romance on the page can only make it that much more charming and exciting for the reader. Cool. Alright, last question. Woohoo! How do you write a good hook for your query letter? I found it to be difficult and rather challenging. Any help is appreciated. Um, my bit of advice is to always just read um, flat copy on books that you buy um, because that's a great example of like how you distill down getting out of plot and getting into story. Like what is it about versus what happens. Um, and they're written by people who work in publishing. So that will give you a sense of kind of what's going on. I also recommend that people write queries for books that they've read but that they themselves did not write. So like... Yeah. Mm -hmm. We suggest that for illustrators sometimes too, like to re-illustrate the cover of something really famous because um, it kind of shows like what your spin on something that's really familiar would be and how you would mix it up and make it a little different. Yep. Yeah, so that is, um, that's our last question. Thank you all for your questions. Yeah. Thanks everybody. And I guess we'll see you next year maybe. Yeah, well hey, we did it from cross country, man. Like I think yeah. that counts. I think that's Nothing what can stop us. Right. <laughs> right. Enjoy the rest of Ride On Con, guys. We'll see you next year. Thanks well, to all the organizers. You work really hard on this conference, and it's great. <laughs>